Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live discussion today. I'm Mandy Moody with the ACFE. I am the communications manager here. And with tradition, we are going to be discussing the five most scandalous fraud cases of 2020. I know you thought 2020 was over, but we still have something that we can learn from the cases last year. Uh, hello to everyone who is here live. Uh, thanks for joining us and hello to all of you who might be watching this later. I know that you might want to watch a recap if you're not able to watch it live. Um, I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas, where we're headquartered, and I'd love for you to let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from. I know we typically have a lot of people from all over the world, and we are so excited that you're joining us today. Uh, I know that uh, 2020 was an unprecedented year, and so we want to talk about those stories that were also unprecedented for the fraud world and what we learned. And everything we discuss today, you'll be able to find on fraudmagazine.com. That's fraud-magazine.com, and it's under the title of Five Most Scandalous Fraud Cases of 2020. I am so excited to be joined virtually today by Bruce Doris, our president and CEO. Say hello, Bruce. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Mason Wilder, our senior research specialist at the ACFE and our in-house uh, newsman who knows about everything going on in the news related to fraud. Right, Mason? That's right. Yeah. So uh, thanks for that flattering introduction. And thanks, everybody, for spending a little bit of your time with us today. Awesome. Well, let's dig right in. Uh, it's no surprise that one of the top cases that we're going to be discussing, really many cases, are the frauds related to COVID-19. Uh, as all of us know that when there is a new pandemic or a new something, there's going to be a lot of fraud associated with it because that's where the fraudsters see vulnerability. So Bruce, um, kick us off and tell us about some of the scams that we saw and what made them so scandalous this past year. Well, again, thanks everyone for being a part of this and thanks to our advisory council at the ACFE for those of you who our members of the ACFE not familiar with that, I really encourage you to go to acfe.com, log in uh, and become a member of that because that is how we got to this point. There are so many frauds that uh, occur despite a pandemic or I guess because of it uh, with this, this first one that we <clears throat> were able to, through that council and through the internal committee here at the ACFE and staff in looking at all of the submissions from around the world and as Mindy mentioned, you know, this first one is touches everyone, whether you are here in the United States where we are, or in Europe, Asia, it doesn't matter. COVID-19 impacted you and what you do as a fraud fighter. And as Mason will, will talk about as well, this is something that has many, many tentacles, depending on where you are. Uh, and, and the first one, probably one of the largest is related to, at least in the United States, uh, with what's called the CARES Act uh, and the uh, European Central Bank and others uh, with, with stimulus money that was used in order to keep economies going uh, around the world. I mean, there was a, basically a shutdown uh, in you know, beginning in, in late December, depending on where you are, uh, and into March and April. So this obviously impacts uh, economies. Uh, and, and the ability for people to work and to earn. And so banks were able, or you know, uh, central banks able to come in and, and give those monies to, in order to stimulate and keep economies afloat. Now, with that said, fraudsters are also going to take complete advantage of that because there's, a, a, we have to get that money out quickly. And no one has seen a pandemic like this before. And so in trying to, to keep people um, safe and alive for that matter, you know, governments are putting money into place. But a lot of times when you move that quickly, a lot of the, the typical controls that we as fraud examiners are used to 
have to aren't front and center as the, as they normally would be. And fraudsters are there to, to take advantage of that. I mean, so you've got that perfect storm uh, for fraud that you, you've got less controls, but you've got large amounts of money. In case in the United States, uh, you had over tri $2 trillion US flooding into an economy at one time uh, with uh, limited safeguards along the way. And what we're seeing now uh, here in you know, January of, of 2021, as we record this, and even through the summer and fall, uh, frauds related to that, the uh, Small Business Administration within the United States in dealing with uh, loan frauds related to the CARES Act, unemployment fraud, uh, so many different things that are coming to light. Uh, in the U.S., there is a new stimulus package out uh, through, uh, that was, I think, just signed into law uh, last week. But there are more safeguards in place now uh, because you know, a little bit more time and in learning from some of the issues that uh, had, had taken place before. In fact, Mike Ware, who is the uh, uh, new elected regent for uh, the ACFE, also the appointed inspector general for the, the SBA in the US, uh, has talked about that. He and I have talked about that personally, about a lot of the safeguards that they're trying to put in place now to, to prevent uh, this continuation of fraud. So. But COVID-19 impacted everyone. So I'll give Mason a little bit of time here uh, to, to also talk about some different aspects as well. Right, so uh, yeah, thanks Bruce. Um, and of course, the, some of the bigger, I guess, price tag kind of items were you know, hit very hard by fraud and that's some of the loan programs or unemployment insurance. Uh, you know, for example, here in the United States, there were major schemes in Washington State and California that had similarities, but were also very different. Uh, it was more kind of systematic in Washington. And, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars in fraud losses from just unemployment benefits. But luckily, they were able to figure out what was going on and how people were exploiting the application system and shut that down relatively quickly. And they re recovered, you know, several hundred million dollars worth of the losses. So that was that was a positive aspect to that. But aside from just the government benefit programs, uh, this was just, um, I mean, uh, uh, practically unprecedented explosion of consumer fraud related to one topic here with the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, yeah, and it was kind of an evolution, and it's still going and still evolving, and will continue to do so as long as this is the major news story that affects everybody, because using anything COVID related as a fishing lure or the kind of prompts for a social engineering scheme or just the topic of some other fraud scheme is something that's going to resonate with literally everyone on the planet, which is, you know, really rare. But things that we saw were at the beginning, there were, it was really heavy on personal protective equipment scams, you know, hospitals and other agencies scrambling to find this PPE. And so there would be fake product listings or companies that were set up to try and get some government contracts, even though they just didn't know what they were doing. And there was a lot of fraud there. There were so many different phishing lures or phishing emails, phone calls related to coronavirus tests, coronavirus cures, coronavirus vaccines now, and um, you know also PPE products. And then as everybody is sitting at home and shopping online, there were a ton of fake product listings and e-commerce scams. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, some, some of the latest statistics put out by the FTC regarding coronavirus or COVID fraud, uh, they indicate that there are more than 300 million in fraud losses reported just in the United States alone, and almost 320,000 individual reports of fraud related to COVID. Uh, with the average loss being about $300 and online shopping was the top category of complaint by a pretty significant margin. But, uh, you know, every disaster produces disaster fraud. And this was just a, a whole different level with the variety of schemes targeting different industries, services, uh, so many different prompts and their 
still going to continue evolving and affecting people. So, um, and, and I don't think, and once COVID is hopefully in the rear view mirror, uh, I think some fraudsters will adapt their tactics um, based on what they learned during the pandemic, whenever the next crisis or disaster comes around. So, uh, you know, um, we're still not through the worst of it yet. And um, the, things are just, we're gonna continue to see a wide variety of fraud scams ripped from the headlines just so that they really resonate with everybody. So you mentioned, oh, go ahead, Bruce. I, I just wanted to elaborate on what he had just said there. I mean, we have had to a, a completely adapt where we have been before uh, in terms of our investigations, our fraud prevention, because we're now all working remotely, depending on where you are in, in some areas of the world coming back slowly, but still it, it, it changed our way. And, and how we're able to go in and fight fraud. Uh, you know, so with all of that, knowing that this, as, as Mason said, this will continue for a while. Uh, I, I look back about 10 plus years ago here in the US uh, after the financial crisis in 08 and 2009, and, and with you know, the amount of money, and of course it was just a, a pittance of what it is now. We think about $800 billion US going into an economy related to the financial crisis then. Uh, seems small almost in comparison, but with the, the sick job, the inspector general for uh, all of these monies coming in, in in terms, that group is still alive and working. Uh, it's not as, as robust and, and large as it was 10 years ago, but it's still around. And so when you start thinking about the amount of monies coming into the economies to help and fraudsters going after that, this is, you know, this is going to take a while to, to unwind. Yeah. No, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. So you answered my question. <laughs> um, yeah, there are going to be a lot of fraud examiners that uh, are going to have careers pretty much solely focused on investigating fraud related to COVID benefit programs for the next decade or so, I think. Yeah. So let's move on. We could probably talk about coronavirus related frauds uh, for another few hours. Yeah. And I think uh, Courtney posted in our messages, you can find a lot of the resources we've created at acfe.com slash coronavirus. And as always, um, a huge reminder to use, you know, these outlets like Facebook, our online community, uh, to, to talk with other fraud fighters from around the world about what, what they're doing um, in their cases and what they're seeing uh, to use that group to get information that could help you in your own cases. So our second scandalous fraud case of 2020 is Wirecard. And this one is just, I mean, this will be a movie. I think we can all agree that this will some, someday be a movie, someday star somebody you know, really famous. $2 billion went missing. Now we have a missing COO. Mason, tell us, Quickly, what happened for those people who don't aren't familiar and where are we now? All right. So really at the at the heart of this is financial statement fraud, where company leadership in, inflated assets uh, so that they could attract investment and help grow the company. Uh, this is a Wirecard is a German financial technology or fintech company that was uh, working with a lot of different third parties all over the world uh, on like payment processing technologies and services, but uh, they had they had grown. They were a European tech darling, and um, nothing but positive uh, reviews and and hype and everything. And uh, then all of a sudden, I think if I'm not mistaken, working on some tips, uh, an investigative reporter from the Financial Times named. Dan McCrum wrote a series of articles. I think the first one was back in January 2019. It started raising some questions about some of Wirecard's business practices uh, around the around the world, and that led to Wirecard responding to these these articles by commissioning um, KPMG to conduct an investigation. And ultimately, KPMG found irregularities and had trouble confirming the existence of cash assets that Wirecard had claimed in financial statements. 
previously. And so um, then uh, Wirecard's regular auditors, EY, who had been signing off on the company's annual financial statements for the prior three or four years, uh, took another look after KPMG's report and they refused to sign off on Wirecard's 2019 finance or financials in uh, summer, just past summer. And that's when the wheels just came off of the whole Wirecard uh, scheme. There was, and it all related to $2 billion in cash assets that Wirecard claimed were just sitting in bank accounts in the Philippines. And uh, EY had apparently just been relying on documentation provided by Wirecard um, or those banks and not, um, you know, doing any independent investigation or confirmation of those balances. Uh, and so EY refused to sign off on the financials. The stock price plummeted. The CEO resigned and was then arrested. Uh, several other executives were charged by German authorities. And then the COO, Jan Marsalek, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but he, he fled and to this day is still MIA despite being on Interpol's most wanted list for about six months now. Uh, he, there were apparently some fake documents that <laughs> indicated that he had traveled to the Philippines. Uh, but then, you know, another investigation said that they had pinned him down in like Belarus or Russia. And so, you know, that's, and it's still ongoing. Um, Wirecard's main office in Germany declared insolvency and they sold off basically any business units that were that still had any value to other companies. And so Wirecard is done. There are legal proceedings still, and there will be shareholder lawsuits, I, I'm sure, and class action lawsuits. But it was a dramatic fall from grace for a European tech darling, all based around uh, something that could have been convict, uh, or prevented by basic uh, bank account confirmation procedures. And this so Chris, Bruce, I don't know if you want to add some context to this, but that's the general gist of the, you know, who, what, where, when, why. Yeah, Bruce, I know we talked before this of, you know, it looks like Enron, it smells like Enron. What, where do you see those connections? Well, it, you're absolutely right, Mandy, and there's a lot of similarities to Enron, not nearly in terms of scale and, and the, uh, the money that uh, is at stake, but still, you've got you've got a lot of those similarities. I mean, you've got a very gregarious uh, leader, uh, uh, or with their CEO with uh, Braun, and you've got a board that is not necessarily informed because of a lot of uh, the transactions. If you look at what uh, Wirecard and how they came to be, it's a lot of acquisitions, so a lot of opaque transactions uh, along the way. As Mason was mentioning uh, with its uh, uh, purchases and acquisitions in, the, in, in Southeast Asia, in particular the Philippines. Uh, I think it was Dan McCrum who, who figured this one out, but you know, you, looking at the location of where they were talking about this acquisition was actually a home uh, with like 10 people living in it. It is a residential, you know, when, when the address is, uh, is looked at a lot closer. And so when you see that, when you see a Dan McCrum, someone who is being threatened by not only the, the individuals who are leading Wirecard, but also government agencies as well, based off Wirecard's influence with them at that time. So, and it just takes me back to when Bethany McLean was starting to unravel, you know, is Enron overpriced uh, back in 2001? And, you know, some of the, the snarky uh, comments made uh, at that time by Jeff Skilling, who was, uh, uh, lead the CEO at, at Enron, and then when you start seeing it implode, uh, I mean, it's just a lot of similarities to me in, in watching how this plays out. A lot of it's still to come. Uh, this one has been playing out for about a year, but um, I think that we'll start getting more and more. Uh, I don't want to say it's going to be the fraud of 2021, but we're going to learn a lot more, I think, as German authorities start uh, uh, unveiling their prosecution and, and what they're going to do. Yeah, and, and then, 
to just add on a little bit more to that, there's so many incredible details about the actual like wire card operations in some of these sketchy jurisdictions where they're handling payment processing for online gambling and you know potential money laundering concerns. But I encourage everybody to go read Dan McCrum's work on this stuff because there's some really incredible details. And speaking of Dan McCrum, uh, I'm going to tell everyone tuning in that uh, a little secret that we haven't officially announced yet, but not only will Dan McCrum, the investigative reporter who first uh, reported on Wirecard, be speaking at our upcoming European conference in March, our virtual event, he will also be keynoting our annual conference this summer and will be receiving our Guardian Award for his reporting on the case. And we are so excited to give that to him. I think it's, it will come as no surprise to us that with a lot of these big frauds and a lot of the frauds over the years, there is the running theme of a whistleblower, of a reporter, of people who pursued things relentlessly, sometimes over years to bring something to light. And that's something that we're really, really excited to honor Dan with. Yeah, attacking, um, I did attacking, want attacking, attacking his wife as well. I mean, there's just yeah. so many uh, elements to this, and, and kudos to him. He's also has a, a cover story of uh, Fraud Magazine coming up, uh, I think in March. So, I mean, it's just just a great, uh, sad story, but um, one that that shows that that uh, perseverance uh, yeah. by investigative reports and what we do as fraud examiners. Just a, it's a great story for that aspect. Yeah. And, and that it pays off, you know, it's, it's not for, for nothing. I want to give a special shout out to Zena Kuzor. She is watching right now and she recently passed her CFE exam. Congratulations, Zena. Just want to give that quick shout out and then we can move on. I know, I'm, I apologize if I did. I tried my very best and we are so excited for you. Okay, we're going to move on to our third case of 2020, and it's the FinCEN files. Uh, a lot of people remember the um, Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, the Luanda leaks, and our latest edition of leaked documents from the ICIJ are the FinCEN files, and really put a spotlight on money laundering. Mason, kick us off. All right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're not going to go super duper in depth on all this stuff. Uh, but, you know, there's I know I've written an article for the Fraud Examiner newsletter about it. Uh, there's you can just go to FinCENFiles.com and read all the series of stories that have come out of uh, the kind of investigation. But so, yeah, this is just like Wirecard, um, uh, kind of reporter-driven or investigative reporter-driven story. And that main reporter is Jason Leopold with BuzzFeed News, who coincidentally, I'm going to be doing a webinar with uh, about the FinCEN files in about an hour or so. Um, and so that would you know, feel free to tune into that if you aren't sick of me by the end of this, or um, you can watch it on demand later. Anyways, uh, so he was contacted by a whistleblower who delivered to him about 2,100 suspicious activity reports, which those are documents that the financial institutions are required to file with FinCEN or the Financial Crimes Enforcement Unit which is the United States Financial Intelligence Unit. Uh, so any suspicious transactions or things that the red flags of money laundering, uh, the banks are supposed to be filling these out and giving them to, to FinCEN. So they got their hands on 2,100 of them. And then Leopold brought in the ICIJ, which is the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists that have produced the Panama and Paradise Papers and Luanda leaks. So we got them all together, about 400 journalists started going through these documents, doing follow-up interviews and investigation and, and reporting out all the different threads of these stories. But it's really, you know, that amount of suspicious activity reports is a very small fraction of the amount of the total amount that FinCEN receives. 
And just that small portion represented about $2 trillion of potentially illicit funds that were moved through big banks, big international financial institutions for drug dealers, terrorists, kleptocrats, politicians, and a variety of other bad actors, organized criminals. Uh, and you know, in some cases, these were the banks that had previously been warned by authorities about not fulfilling their anti-money laundering obligations or not complying with regulations and doing business with people they shouldn't be doing business with. And in some cases, these banks were carrying out these transactions while under a deferred prosecution agreement for previous violations um, you know, with the US Department of Justice. Uh, some of the banks that were featured most prominently in this specific report were Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, HSBC, Standard Chartered. Um, those, are, those were the, the main ones. And, you know, it just, it really shows how big of a problem money laundering is and how difficult it is to, to, to get these banks to really crack down on it um, and, you know, how prevalent it is. And so there's, it's generated a lot of calls for improved or uh, enhanced regulations. And especially with shell companies, which have been a major feature of all these uh, reports like the Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. And the US did just recently pass the Corporate Transparency Act, which should make it much more difficult to set up shell companies where the beneficial ownership is you know, hidden or obscured. And so hopefully that will help with this, but um, you know, it's a big story. There's there's lots of resources to read further into it. And, you know, if you are if you don't have anything to do in an hour, you can hear it straight from Jason Leopold, too, as I talk to him. Yeah, to, to Mason's point, recently out of the, the, I think it was the Defense Act, if that's uh, correct, Mason, with yeah, a lot of that related to shell yeah. companies and getting that information out and making it more transparent. Uh, and it's a huge step forward in AML. And I think Mason, you may even be going over that more in your webinar here shortly. But I think that's a tremendous impact because if you look back all the SARS related to this, uh, to the FinCEN files, I mean, it goes back probably what, 10 years, I think. Uh, uh, Mason, yeah, no, no, the the earliest ones were from 1999, I think. Uh, okay, even more, okay. Um, so I think that coupled with that and with the new legislation, at least in the U.S., and you'll probably see some adoption uh, around the world as well. I think that we're going to take some step forwards in terms of, um, the, the, at least from the anti-fraud uh, side of things, and getting some more transparency in, in shell companies. I know that a lot of members deal with this issue uh, and are experts in this issue, and so um, it's a good step forward. Happened just within the last couple of weeks, but uh, you know we'll be getting more information out for you uh, as members very, very soon. In fact, in an hour, if you're watching live right now with Mason. <laughs> Mason is our uh, ACFE celebrity. He's just, he's everywhere. Yeah, I guess so. Uh... <laughs> uh, let's move on to Airbus. Uh, I know Airbus was actually the largest fine ever recorded in a bribery case last year. And... Bruce, tell us a little bit about how this was a lot about teamwork and, you know, multiple different countries doing different things, but working together and, and what we saw with Airbus. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Airbus scandal, uh, it, you know, like a lot of things, you know, it had gone on for a number of years. Uh, some self-reporting also associated with Airbus and how this came to light. But as Mandy, as you mentioned, it was about a $4 billion fine collectively. That's with the United States, uh, the UK, and, and France. But going back and looking at violations of, at least within the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, UK Bribery Act, and how they were trying to get not just defense contracts uh, within uh, China and in other countries as well, and then commercial aviation too. I mean, you. you there were a lot of bribes uh, associated with this, a lot of luxury trips for officials uh, in various countries. But there, again, there was a, um, a self-reporting. And so if you think about that in, in terms of a compliance side and whether or not had they not uh, had that aspect of what would that 
that uh, amount have been. Uh, when you're looking at, you know, and the primary uh, amount of that four billion U.S. Uh, was in France. But to your point, Mandy, when you've got that collective, I guess, synergy between the U.S., the U.K., and the France government uh, coming together to fight fraud uh, and to share that information, that is something that we have really pushed at the ACFE for a long, long time. Uh, if you look at acfe.com in terms of our law enforcement and government alliance and how we're able to pull different agencies together. Man, I know going back when I was a prosecutor uh, many, many years ago uh, within the U.S., how federal, state, and local law enforcement come together in order to you know, fight, and, and at least in my case, in terms of uh, financial crimes. But watching and seeing how this, uh, the jurisdictions of various countries come together, uh, you know, especially with a company like Airbus, who is around the world, uh, and in pulling that together, it's a good sign that you know, we're, and this was back in, I think in January of 2020, but you know, a little bit more challenging in, in, with, in the COVID world, but it's a good, good sign to show how collaborative uh, various governments and regulators are. Yeah, and, and one, uh, one another potential takeaway uh, from this, a good anti-fraud angle for other similar corporations that are multinational, big you know, corporations, if you find something during an internal review, no matter how that's prompted, I think in this case, there was a, a UK serious fraud office investigation that prompted an internal review and internal auditing where Airbus did find some irregularities and some indications of bribery. And they self-reported that to French authorities. And had they not self-reported that, the fine probably would have been about twice as much. So you know, um, a little bit of honesty goes a long way, I guess, you know, about $4 billion worth in this case. Yeah, honesty, honesty pays off, literally, a little bit. Um, last case we're going to mention, we're on number five now, is Luck and Coffee. And this is one that I know we were watching for a long time here. Um, and there are a lot of parallels to Wirecard. I think something that to be noted that we've mentioned in all of these cases is just how global they are. Uh, this is probably the first year where I've just, when we've been going over these stories where I've just sat back and been stunned at the dollar amounts. Um, they're just so large uh, and they're so big. Um, what can we say about Luckin, Bruce? Um, I know there are a lot of fabricated financials. What happened with Luckin and, and what's going on now? Yeah, I mean, and maybe this is one of my, I don't want to say favorite fraud, but it, of 2020, the ones that really stood out to me, and I've been following this one for a number of months with Luckin Coffee, uh, you know, the, the, the Starbucks of China, uh, as it's been dubbed many times. Uh, you've got, um, I think it was about a 300 plus million dollars U.S., uh, overstatement of revenue. Uh, and it, what with, with this particular company it was growing incredibly fast and looking at some, a lot of the aggressive um, push uh, in terms of opening up kiosks with a little bit lower cost than a traditional uh, shop uh, over the last couple of years, uh, especially. And it was a lot of deep discounts in terms of the price of the coffee uh, as it was being. And so you start thinking about it, and a lot of research analysts, uh, Muddy Waters being one of them, really starting to, to look at it. This is about a year ago now. Uh, like, hey, how are you able to really sustain this type of net income based off what we're seeing here? And then you know, the pandemic hits, and yet you start looking at these sales and like, hey, wait, you're shut down. How are you able to sustain this? And then you know, the, the um, the proverbial um, you know, cats out of the bag, whatever you want to call it in terms of, hey, we've got some serious problems here. And then that's when you know, that $300 million plus uh, overstatement was uh, released. Uh, the CEO, COO both uh, let go uh, from Luck and Coffee. Stock price plunges uh, within, I think, minutes or hours uh, of that being released. Uh, it's delisted off NASDAQ here in the U.S., uh, still being traded uh, in, in China, as I recall. But 
you know, that was just a, a, a huge uh, uh, fraud and watching how it um, just unraveled in just a matter of almost days or months, really, uh, back in the, in the spring of 2020. And uh, just a couple extra, you know, pieces of, of context here uh, about this story. This is, you know, sometimes when when a when a company that's in a jurisdiction that is uh, not quite as friendly to outside researchers, such as China, is listed on a U.S. market, it can make it really hard for due del due diligence and analysis of what's really going on because of lack of transparency or, you know, difficulties getting information from certain jurisdictions. And so this is an example of that. And plus, while it was just a 300, or I mean, just, while it was a 300 million plus overstatement of revenue, the, the impact of the fraud financially was much larger because of the growth that that 300, or the amount of investment in the company and the growth and increase in the, country, the company's stock price that resulted from that overstatement of revenue. And I think uh, the, the value of the company that was wiped out when the fraud was revealed was more than a billion dollars. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the financial impact is even bigger than just the, the overstatement fraud. Yeah, there's still class action suits going on. I think, uh, in fact, Luckin, I think settled with the, the SEC in the US back late last year. Uh, for a, a multi-million dollar fine. And I think that they've settled with regulators in China as well. And so it's sort of a shift. I still think from what I was doing, some, some research prior to coming in here on that, still ways before you know, Luckin would, um, I guess, move forward based off uh, analysts um, that, that are out there. But it was just a, a tremendous uh, fraud for 2020 uh, that the Advisory Council and the, uh, our internal committee here came up with. Definitely one of the top five. Definitely. That wraps up our top five, Bruce and Mason. Thank you so much for talking to us about these and giving us your insights. And I certainly appreciate it. I know the people who are tuning in do because it means they don't have to go and read a ton about it. They can just listen to you guys summarize it and then use it in their next conversation and, and sound like they knew it all along. So but thank you read, both. If they do want to read it though, Mandy, to the Fraud Magazine. Uh, for the yeah. January, uh, uh, February edition, 2021, go look at it if you want to go in, in more. There are links uh, within the story uh, as well as acfe.com for membership. So please go and, and look at that and all the other resources that are there, of course. And we've also got uh, three dishonorable mentions that we have in the online version that are just as relevant. Uh, the Carlos Ghosn story is another one that is just incredible and will leave you speechless. So I encourage you to go look that up on fraudmagazine.com. And also, I'm sure there are stories that we missed. So please write those in the comments, uh, share the links with us, let us know what cases you saw that just kind of blew your mind, uh, what you learned from. I think we can all agree that even though these cases are shocking, there is always something that we can take away from it. Uh, as fraud examiners. And we thank you all who are tuning in. And we thank you all for the work that you're doing, because I'm sure you are working on cases just like these, or you might even be working on cases related to these cases. <laughs> um, so thank you all for tuning in. And we will see you next month or next, I know we'll see you next year to talk about another top five. Uh, so thank you all and have a wonderful day.